Curtis, instructor for this course, which is Physics 100, and this is the video lecture for Chapter 24, Magnetism. Let's get started. So let's talk a little bit about magnetism. Let's talk about where the word comes from. And that word magnetism comes from uh, the mineral magnetite, which was basically the first uh, observation of magnetism in the real world. People found magnetite out in nature and they saw that it had these special properties. And so magnetism was a word that was coined to describe those properties. Magnetite is the most magnetic of all naturally occurring minerals. There are other minerals that have magnetic properties, but none of them uh, are more magnetic than magnetite. And you can see the chemical formula for that there on your screen, Fe304. Now, Fe304, that means it's an oxide of iron. And that's where you, that's where you typically find iron in nature. You find it as an oxide. Uh, you can sometimes find it as a sulfide, but it's more common to find it as an oxide. And among iron oxides, there's two other types of iron ore that are oxides, one being wustite, which is FeO, and the other being hematite, which is the most common form of iron ore, Fe203. Magnetite gained its name from magnesia. This is the area of Greece where the mineral uh, naturally occurred in ancient times. This is where many of its properties were first observed. Uh, magnetite has also been called lodestone. So if in some of the older literature you run across this word lodestone, you know you're talking about magnetite. Magnetite naturally experiences attraction to magnets, and it can also become permanently magnetized. Let's talk about that magnetic property for a moment. Uh, magnetism and electricity are actually very similar to each other, okay? But there's also some important differences, so we need to be aware of both the similarities and the differences. Now, an electric charge can be positive or negative, and in like manner, magnets have a north pole and a south pole. So, so far, we're pretty much running on the same level ground here. However, there's a big difference between magnets and electric charges, and that is if you take a magnet and divide it into two pieces, each of those smaller pieces will immediately develop its own north and south pole. So uh, that's not what you see with electric charges, okay? Uh, single point charges do exist. Uh, you don't necessarily have to have a negative charge uh, with every positive charge or vice versa. So, single point charges do exist, uh, but, uh, you know, you can't get that with a magnet. Uh, there's been a lot of research done into what are called monopole magnets, magnets that have only a north pole or only a south pole, but as yet, they've not been able to discover it. Apparently, it's one of those things where everything has to have its opposite. Uh, but magnets do operate just like electric charge in that like poles repel and opposite poles attract. So if you take uh, the north pole of two magnets and you try to put them together, you're going to feel resistance there. Same thing if you try to put two south poles together. However, if you put a north pole and a south pole next to each other, uh, you get them close enough and go, oh, good luck keeping them apart because they're going to come together. So like repels like, opposites attract. Now, when we were talking earlier about electrical forces, we compared them with gravitational forces. And this comparison was appropriate because these are not forces in motion. These are static forces, forces that are always present. Well, magnetic forces are different because they result from the motion of electrical forces, or more specifically, electrical charge. So, if an electrical charge is stationary, you're not going to have magnetic forces. You have to have the charge in motion in order for a magnetic force to exist. And that's an important distinction uh, with the magnetic forces as opposed to electrical forces or gravitational forces. Now, both electrical and magnetic forces are separate, 
but they're related manifestations of what we call electromagnetic fields. And we'll be getting more into the electromagnetic fields and the electromagnetic spectrum in future chapters. Uh, but for right now, just understand that they're really, it, it's kind of like they're uh, two different perspectives on the same thing. Let's talk a little bit more about that magnetic field. Charges have electrical fields that are traveling along electrical lines of force. And the direction that they travel by convention that we've adopted is from positive to negative. Well, you see something similar with magnetic fields. Magnetic fields also travel along magnetic lines of force. And by convention, those lines of force go from north poles to south poles. Also similar to what we see in electric fields, the closer together those lines of force are, the stronger the field is in that region. That's what we saw with electric fields. We see the same thing with magnetic fields. Now, keep in mind, like we said earlier, magnetic forces do not exist where there's no electric charge in motion. So if electric charges are in motion, you're going to get a magnetic force. And because of that, magnetic fields result when electric field is moving. So if you put an electric field in motion, uh, then you're going to get a magnetic field. And that's easy enough to do. I mean, once if you every electric charge has its own electric field. So if you put the charge in motion, the electric field surrounding that charge will be in motion. And so it's, it's a, it just means that either the electric charge or the electric field, you're going to get a magnetic force when that field or charge is in motion. Now, electric fields we saw earlier were vectors. Same thing with magnetic fields. Magnetic fields are also vectors, but they act perpendicular in direction to the electric field. So whatever direction the electric field is in, the magnetic field is going to act in a direction perpendicular to that direction. The magnetic field about a straight wire carrying electric current is just a series of concentric circles about the wire. So just as we saw with electric fields, where the electric field was basically a series of concentric circles around a wire with a current traveling through. It's the same thing with the magnetic field. You're going to get the same thing out of that. So if we take several compasses and place them as you see there in the uh, image there on your screen, if we place them around the wire and we put an electric current through the wire, then the needles inside each of the compasses are going to align along the magnetic lines of force in the magnetic field. The magnetic field is, of course, generated by the moving charge that's inside the wire. That's what current is. Current is charge in motion. Now, if we reverse the direction of the current, then that's going to reverse the direction of the magnetic field. And so that's going to flip the needles in the, in the compasses. They'll flip around and go the other way. Let's add a little twist here to our tail. So if we take that wire and we put a loop in it, we know that the electric field lines are going to conform to the shape of the conductor. Well, guess what? Magnetic field lines are going to do exactly the same thing. They're going to crowd themselves in loops around that loop in the wire. So if we have a single loop in the wire, then the magnetic field is going to conform around that loop. And once we take the current away, the magnetic field disappears because it's the motion of the current that produces the magnetic field and not the charge itself. The charge has to be in motion. So once we turn the current off, charge is no longer in motion, and therefore we don't get a magnetic field. It's that motion part that produces the magnetic field. We can add more loops to our wire, but then we see that the magnetic field lines conform to the shape that we create. So note that we have uh, here magnetic fields around the single coil. And then we've got magnetic field lines around the coil that you see there on the bottom over towards the right. So 
we're not looking at circles that go around each loop. Now we've got circles that go around the entire coil. Okay, and that's an important distinction to remember. So if you've got multiple loops in a wire, the magnetic field lines are going to circle the entire coil. This is a little bit different from the electric field lines because the electrical field lines are going to circle the shape of the conductor. So it's going to go through each of those coils and loops individually. But not so with the magnetic field. The magnetic field lines are going to go around the entire coil, as you see there from the pattern of the iron fillings there in the photo. So again, if we take the current and we remove it, we're also going to get rid of the magnetic field because magnetic fields result from charges in motion. Here's a pretty cool video that talks about magnetism and some things that you can do with it. Hopefully this will pop up here if I can get it to get it to go. Hang on a minute. Was, oh, I gotta flip a switch. Hang on. Okay, here we go. Got it flipping up now. Let's start this up. And it should load up here. Let's switch it on. Let's see what it does. Through this coil of thick wire, we're about to pass a huge alternating electric current. On top is a one kilogram aluminum plate. So we hear this noise. What's that noise? It's the vibration of the plate because it's vibrating at uh, two times the frequency of this, side, of the, this Wha one. Whoa! <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> How does it do that? To find out, I've come to the place where it all started, the Royal Institution in London. This is the key to Faraday's magnetic lab. It's amazing that that lock still works. From the 1870s it also became a storeroom, which is why it survived, and it survived intact, all the joinery, giant electromagnet, uh, exactly the same as Faraday. Uh, so this is exactly it. as Faraday would have had. That's right, yep. In Faraday's time, it was known that electric current creates a magnetic field, but it remained an open question whether the reverse is possible, if a magnetic field could generate electric current. Faraday answered this question with his most famous apparatus. Faraday's electromagnetic induction ring, which is this. In August 1831, Faraday wrapped two coils of insulated wire around this iron ring. But in 1831, you could not go down to your local electrical hardware shop and ask for 600 meters of insulated wire. You had to insulate the wire as you went. And so as you pushed and pulled the wire out of the ring, you had to insulate it. It takes 10 working days, which is a huge investment of time. But the investment paid off. When Faraday connected a battery to one of the coils, he saw a brief pulse of current in the other coil. And when he disconnected the battery, he saw a pulse of current in the other direction. He realized that current was induced in the second coil only when the magnetic field through it was changing. And if they hadn't been wrapped on the same ring, Faraday may have noticed that the two coils repel each other when the current is induced, and that's due to the interaction of their magnetic fields. Which brings us back to this. Through the bottom coil, we are passing a huge electric current, 800 amps, which alternates in direction 900 times per second. This ensures there will always be a changing magnetic field above the coil. Instead of a second coil, we're using the aluminium plate, but the principle is the same. The changing magnetic field induces currents in the plate that create an opposing magnetic field, so it levitates. Oh. <laughs> How awesome is that? <laughs> This current is not only good for levitating the plate, it can also make light bulbs glow. A gift. Oh, thank you. Oh, <laughs> that is it's cool. Not, not too close because it uh, will uh, burn the, the, the arms. Can I put it there? Yeah. And just as current in a toaster element heats it up, the induced current in the plate dissipates its energy as heat. It's some water too. Thank you. Yeah, to see the, the temperature. In. Check out how hot this plate is. Oh, that is nuts! Is this your favorite demo? It's like a flying barbecue or something. Tell me this is not the best dinner table centerpiece. It levitates, it gives you light, and you can cook on it. And all the while, you're demonstrating Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction. But where do they get that matter to grow? Yeah. It's neutral inside the grain. That saw already, yeah. Goodness. Because the flame the has those ions in it, it means that we can break down a greater distance of air. 
goodness. There's greater goodness. conductivity. Why isn't there a big hole around the tree where it's taken out all the soil? Because it doesn't say gradually that the soil has time to recover. <laughs> you love it. Yeah, so that, I like that video. That's actually a pretty cool video. Uh, because, you know, it's just these things levitating and turning on without wires. <laughs> you know, it's just really cool stuff. So, let's uh, look at an activity that's based on the video that we just saw. So, in your workbook, go ahead and answer the following questions after you stop the video. One, the coils below the plate had 800 amps of current running through them. What type of current was it, and why would that type be used? Two, what caused the high-pitched noise in the room? Three. What effect explains why the narrator was using tongs to move the levitating plate and what caused that effect? So go ahead, stop the video and work these questions out in your workbook and then when you're ready, restart the lecture video and we'll see how you did. Okay, let's see how you did with this. So the first question, the coils below the plate had 800 amps of current running through them what type of current was it? And why would that type be used? Well, the coils were using alternating current. Because remember, it's not just the presence of a charge that's producing the magnetic field, but the change in current that's producing the magnetic field. So with alternating current, you get not just a change in the charge that's flowing through the wire, but you also get a change in direction. So it flitches back and forth, and that change in motion, again, is what creates the magnetic field. Two, what caused the high-pitched noise in the room? Well, that noise is going to come from the vibration of the aluminum atoms that are being excited by the magnetic field. And three, what effect explains why the narrator was using tongs to move the levitating plate, and what caused that effect? Well. He was using tongs because the plate was much too hot to touch. I mean, remember he said he could cook on it. Well, you don't want to be touching that with your bare hands. You could burn yourself. So what is it that's causing the plate to be, to be heated? Well, again, the, the same thing that's causing the noise that you heard in the room. The high-pitched noise was from the vibration of the aluminum atoms. Well, guess what? All that vibration is going to generate thermal energy, which is going to be... Uh, which you're going to be coming out of the material in the form of heat. So heat being generated from the magnetic field, uh, also from the current that's induced in the aluminum plate from the magnetic field. So the magnetic field induces a current in the aluminum plate, aluminum conducting electricity. And so this current running through the plate is also going to generate some heat from the resistance that the material offers the electric current. Let's look at forces that are on wires that have currents running through them in a magnetic field. So the magnetic fields are going to have forces associated with them. And we know about the magnetic lines of force that the field travels through, but it's going to impose a force on objects that are within that magnetic field, especially if those objects are conducting electricity or more appropriately, if they're, conduct, if they're magnetic, if they can conduct the magnetic lines of force, then they can have a force associated uh, on that object. So what effect does the force have on a wire carrying current? Well, in this case, if you see a current going into the wire, as you see there in the graphic, there's gonna be a force that's gonna pull the wire down. So the wire will actually deflect inside the magnetic field. Now what happens if you reverse the current? If you turn that around, now the current's coming out of the wire as opposed to going into it. Now notice the force flipped directions. Now it's going the other way. The force in each case is acting perpendicular to both the current and the magnetic field. And the magnitude of that magnetic force is gonna depend both on the, the magnitude of the current and the strength of the electric and magnetic fields. 
we can use these magnetic forces to power an electric motor. So here's a setup for a simple motor. We've got a permanent magnet, and so there's a north and a south pole that you see there, and then in between those two poles, we're going to insert a rectangular shaped wire loop. And when we put a current through that wire, it's going to produce a magnetic field. Now, of course, like repels like. So that's going to push the wire around half a cycle so that the, the half of the wire loop that's got the south pole of the magnetic field is towards the north pole of the magnet. At this point, if you switch the direction of the current, guess what? Now you switch the polarity of the magnetic field. Now you've got north with north and south with south. That repels again, turning the wire loop another half revolution. And so if you just keep alternating the current back and forth like that, you can get the wire loop to keep turning inside that permanent magnet. And that's the basic idea behind electric motors. You're using an induced magnetic force to turn me uh, mechanical objects inside the motor. We saw that shielding was possible with electric fields, and that's because the electric field can move in more than one direction. Magnetic fields can do the same thing. They can move in more than one direction, and so therefore, magnetic shielding is possible, just like you had uh, electric shielding. You can have magnetic shielding. And it's the same basic principle that we saw with electric shields. If you want to shield something electrically, you need to put it inside something that's electrically conductive. Well, same thing with magnetic shielding. If you want to shield something from a magnetic field, you need to put it in something that can actually conduct a magnetic field. So highly magnetic materials make good shields from magnetic fields. Here's another video that talks about magnetic fields, uh, in particular the aspect of magnetic shielding. Now, I gotta warn you, this building is, I mean, guy that's talking on this video is really boring and dull, but the information he's presenting is actually pretty good. So let's take a moment here and check this video out. If I can get this to start. Hi. In my previous video, I destroyed a computer with a big magnet. All the errors were related to the hard disk drive, so in this video, I will dissect the drive and see if there's any visual damage. I will also explain how they managed to put a powerful neodymium magnet inside the hard disk drive without erasing all data. But first, let's pull the drive out. Ok, it is a 30GB drive dated March 2004. Let's open it. Alright, this drive is kinda upside down because the data side of the platter and the read write head are not visible. Time to remove the platter and see if it is scratched, which would explain the arrows. Now I'm not an expert, but I have disassembled a lot of drives to get the magnet out of them. And on this drive killed by a magnet, I found no physical damage. No scratches on the platter, no bent or misaligned parts, all looked perfect. So I guess Ben was spot on with his comment. I simply erased most, if not all, data on the platter including the file allocation table. But if a big magnet can erase the data on the platter from the outside, why and how do they put a magnet inside the hard disk drive without any trouble? Well, the magnet is there to move the read-write head across the platter to access the files. The copper coil you can see over the magnet works as an electromagnet when an electric current runs through it. It is often called a voice coil motor, named after the voice coil on a loudspeaker that works in a similar way. If we send an electric audio signal through this, nothing really happens, because the electromagnet has nothing to react on but air. Let's put a magnet near it. It 
In the same way, the actuator in the hard disk drive would not react without the magnet. So that's why they put it there. Okay, so why does the magnet not erase the data on the platter very near to it? I believe there are two reasons. The first is obvious. The magnet sits in a bracket of metal that shields the magnetic field coming from the magnet. Let's test if this really works. First with the magnet facing the paperclip. Not really shielded. Now with the bracket between the magnet and the paperclip. That is surprisingly well shielded. Other samples are less good, although they still clearly reduces the magnetic field. The brackets are typically made of an alloy called permalloy or similar alloys with so-called high magnetic permeability. This just means that the magnetic field lines are very easily formed in the alloys, so they attract magnetic field lines like a sponge attracts water. Sort of. The second reason is less obvious, but I think it also limits how far the magnet's field extends. Let's take a look at the polarity of a hard disk drive magnet. The north pole of the yellow magnet is marked with a black line, and since opposites attract, this must be a south pole on the unmarked magnet. So it may be magnetized like a common disk magnet, where, seen from the side, we have one pole on each of the large surfaces. And the magnetic field lines follow a pattern like this. But that is not the case. On the same surface, we also have a north pole, so it could be more like a common bar magnet, with a magnetic field more like this. To confirm this, let's test the other large surface of the magnet. Now, this is where things take a turn, because the magnet actually has four poles. Two north poles and two south poles. I think this advanced solution compresses the magnetic field to be something like this. I may have exaggerated the illustrations to make my point more clear, but notice how the field lines do not have to bend all around the magnet to find the opposite pole on the hard disk drive magnet. This gives a smaller magnetic field that is even easier to shield and keep away from the data on the platter. Alright, that's all for now. Remember to like if you did like, and maybe subscribe for more to come. See ya! Alright, like I said, the guy doesn't have the most exciting voice in the world, but it was a very informative video. And that brings us to the end of this video. So, hope you found it helpful. Thanks for watching, and we will see you in the next video.